Hello, this is Hear Her Sports, the podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about female athletes and other women in sport. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Today, I get to talk food with Mary Ellen Kelly, the sports dietitian of the WNBA team, New York Liberty. I couldn't be more excited and am incredibly grateful for her time. Mary Ellen Kelly is credentialed as a registered dietitian and board certified sports dietitian. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition from Boston University, where she was a four year member of the NCAA Division I varsity women's track and field team. She earned her master's degree in clinical nutrition from New York University. In 2014, she was hired as a full time team dietitian for the NFL team, Miami Dolphins, and worked with them for over three years. Mary Ellen was the head sports nutritionist at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and prior to UNC, she served as the campus dietitian sports nutritionist at St. John's University in Queens, New York. In 2018, Mary Ellen Kelly founded her private practice and nutrition consulting business, Fuel Forward. That link is in the show notes. During her career, Mary Ellen has worked with individual athletes and high school and collegiate teams. She has had a long list of impressive clients, including Baylor University, Bloomsburg University, Boston College Varsity Women's Lacrosse and Field Hockey, Boston University, Golf Mind and Body, LaSalle University, North Coast Seafood, and USA Lacrosse. In the episode, we talk about her work with Liberty, being a vegan athlete, importance of getting enough protein and fiber, why nutrition is both simple and complicated, essentials of fueling adequately, high school, collegiate, and aging athletes. I did debate with myself about including the section of today's episode on being a vegan athlete, but ended up deciding yes, because it's an interesting counter to the conversation with the cross-country ski racer, 21-year-old Sydney Palmer Ledger, who has been a vegan for 12 years. Make sure to go back and listen to that one. Before we get going, a couple of things for context. In the conversation, I mentioned racing back in the day. To be more precise, it was in the 90s. I also mention oral contraceptives as the cure for PMS as being antiquated. I say that because we now know it doesn't always solve the PMS issues and taking oral contraceptives can be harmful in many other ways. It did not work for me, that is for sure. In the book, Hormone Intelligence, author Aviva Ram writes about oral contraceptives and hormones. The book is available in the What is Elizabeth Reading section on our bookshop page at hearhersports.com books. That's it for me for the moment. There is so much good stuff in this episode, so please enjoy. Here is sports dietitian Mary Ellen Kelly. Hello, Mary Ellen. This is really fantastic to have you here. I always love talking about food, so this is especially fun for me. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat with you. Well, good. To get us started, could you just introduce the work that you do? Because it sounds like from your website, you work with a lot of different kinds of people. Absolutely. So I'm a registered dietitian. I am a board certified sports dietitian. And so I've been really fortunate throughout my journey to work with athletes and active individuals. Um, So my company, Fuel Forward, we support a whole host of clients, you know, whether it is a lot of high school athletes, college student athletes, or folks training for races, a kind of a wide variety of athletes and active individuals. And then um, I do support as a consultant, the WNBA New York Liberty currently. That is very cool. Does it feel cool to you? (laughs) Oh, so cool that we have such a great group and, you know, had a fantastic season last year and looking forward to our upcoming season. So one of the big questions I have for you is that I used to bike race and this was, you know, back in the day. And the thought of having a dietitian as part of our team staff, like we would have all laughed, you know. So can you talk a little bit about the history of teams having, you know, like basically thinking that food and nutrition is important enough to actually support this kind of uh, help, I would say, for the athletes? 
Great question. And honestly, this is something I, I really enjoy talking about is really just the growth and evolution of the role of the dietitian in higher level sport or, or really in sport in general. I always say I've sort of been a student of that process, um, just sort of at the same time that my career has evolved. The profession has evolved quite a bit over the last 20 years as well. And one of the examples I can give you is just in 1994, there was one full-time sports dietitian in all of collegiate athletics. So at the University of Nebraska, pioneer sports dietitian Dave Ellis was the full-time dietitian for the University of Nebraska. And what we've seen since 1994, now, you know, fast forward to 2024 is just an incredible growth of these positions. And so I always say nutrition was always happening because athletes were always eating, but that information was being provided by a whole host of other folks who have a lot of other things on their plate, right? The athletic trainers and the strength coaches and many of the other people who were sort of answering these questions and and doing that work. And now with the work of many pioneers, there's been significant growth at the collegiate level, so Division I specifically, but we're seeing sports dietitians and dietitians having their hand in work at the Division II and Division III level and at high school. We're seeing the expansion at the professional level throughout the Olympics and even in tactical performance nutrition. So it's been really remarkable to see that more and more spaces are recognizing the need to put a dietitian into that space to support their athletes. Do you know where that change came from? Like, wh- why did somebody somebody decide finally that nutrition uh, wasn't important enough? Such a good question. I think, you know, the credit belongs to a lot of groups and a lot of, you know, hardworking people that have, that have been pushing the understanding of, of the importance of this. So, We'll say, you know, Collegiate and Professional Sports Dietitians Association, CPSDA, is a group that I'm a part of. Also, there's a practice group of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. For a long time, it was known as SCAN, and its acronym has switched to SHPN, but it's a second group that really sort of pushed that agenda as well. And the collaboration of a couple of big groups and and many individuals just really kind of knocking on doors and showing the importance and having hard conversations, whether it be with coaches, athletic directors, parents, sort of anyone who would listen to kind of understand that this is a position that really could support the student athletes or the athletes and offload the other practitioners that are doing so many so much other work. And then really it is the dietitians that have that extra level of education in medical nutrition therapy and can really specialize and provide that higher level of care that many of the athletes are looking for. Do you know if it came from sort of the sense of there were problems and, you know, like it was seen that we need to solve these problems and they were sort of, you know, nutrition-based problems? Or was it more from the performance side of like, hey, you know, like we might be able to get more from our athletes if we just learn how to fuel a little better? You know, probably a combination of the two. There's definitely some forward thinkers that really saw the piece that this ties into overall health and performance. And then absolutely, I'm sure that there were many positions that were created in reaction to some sort of a challenge, whether it be dietary supplement challenges where athletes were taking things that they needed, you know, a higher level of guidance because they weren't taking what they were supposed to, or whether there were some dietary practices that needed, you know, professional guidance to support. But many reasons show up for teams and individuals to recognize that the guidance of a sports dietitian could be useful. And then, of course, there are some forward thinkers that may just realize that they needed this before problems arose. Do you have a sense of like where we are in understanding nutrition? And, you know, like you're talking about 20 years ago where there were basically no sports nutrition on college teams to now we have them. But where are the athletes in terms of understanding? You know, are they arriving, I guess, onto the collegiate team with knowledge about nutrition? Such a great question. They are they are definitely coming with with information. Um, we don't know, you know, if yeah. they're coming with the correct information, right? right? So I think, you know, if I can go back to my own personal experience as a student athlete myself at Boston University, I didn't have 
nutrition at my fingertips, right? Like, you know, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have all of this information. So for better or for worse, you know, student athletes in the 90s weren't coming to college with an overflow of information. And so now our student athletes, we'll say at the college level, are showing up with a ton of information. The question is, you know, are they coming with correct information? And some of them are. Some of them have very well-intentioned individuals, you know, that support them, that are giving them correct information, and they've been provided that, you know, whether it is by a dietitian or perhaps their parents or whoever's around them. And then many of them do show up to college campuses grossly misinformed. And that is just a great place for sports dietitians to intervene and help them understand, you know, how they can optimally fuel their body and take really good care of themselves through the lens of nutrition. What drew you to sports nutrition? I mean, put yourself too in that history that you talked about where at 94, there was only one collegiate sports nutritionist. Yeah. Such a great question. What drew me to nutrition? So I tell everybody, I'm like, I have the best job there could be. I get to talk about food and sports all day long, my two favorite topics. I was raised in a home where I joke that like the two primary love languages in our house were food and sport. I have three brothers and everybody was sort of rushing around from sport to sport all the time. And um, my Mother's side is Italian, and there was just always a plethora of incredible, amazing homemade food. Um, We were very fortunate to just have a great cook in my mom. And so just sort of really being raised with really nice, balanced meals and then being raised with sports all the time, I think those were the two things that brought me the most joy throughout my childhood. And so that sort of led to this profession So at the time when I said, I think this is what I want to be when I grow up, I remember very clearly my dad telling me, you're probably going to end up working in a nursing home or on a hospital floor. You know, these jobs don't really exist. And he and I just laugh about it now. He was was correct. I mean, when we were having these conversations in the 90s, there were there were some incredible pioneers that were doing some work, but I would say it wasn't a known path and profession and there, there really weren't a ton of jobs. Um, People were sort of paving their own way. Um, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. How did you even, how did it even occur to you to combine these two things? Oh, because I mean, I just, I think for me, I thought how I fuel my body and what I eat as a young athlete. I I was a triple jumper in college. I was a a gymnast growing up and then kind of switched over to track in high school. And I just paid attention. I knew I could tell the difference between how I fueled my body and how it showed up on the track. And um, I was just always so dialed into it. And I, I could tell even with like my teammates around me, it was just something I noticed in high school. And I was like, there has to be a way that this ties. And, you know, then I fast forward, I get to college and I slowly started learning in my nutrition classes, obviously about nutrition and continued to just say like, this has to be tied to performance. And at the time that my career started to begin, I think the profession was really, there were more and more people doing the work um, in that space. And, And there were people doing it. There was just so few doing it in like the 80s and 90s. Right. Of course. Yeah. And what did you want to accomplish? I just, I wanted to help athletes. I wanted to help them understand that there was a way that they could correlate fluid and food and tie it to maximizing their body's performance. I didn't know what that would look like. I didn't know. I don't think I had a picture of would this be in a team setting? Would I be on a sideline? Would I be traveling with teams and setting up their meals? Like, I I didn't really know what it would look like. I just wanted to connect with individuals on two things that are so important and I'm so passionate about is really just performance and food. I mean, was part of this interest that you sense that your teammates and other people were just not doing it in a way that was, uh, I don't know, making their performance as best as they could be? Sure, sure. I mean, if any of my old teammates ever listened to this, I'm not trying to talk about anybody. You know, no. I mean, I think It's clear you're on a college campus and there's just so many things going on with regards to um, food and bodies and, and, and alcohol and hydration and everything. And I knew that there was a way that those who dial in their nutrition more probably were going to see and their sleep and, and, you know, their overall self-care of their body. I knew it would all tie in together. And 
like we said, this was happening. It just wasn't as visible and as known as it is now. It sort of, in some ways, feels like a superpower to me or, or like sort of the <laughs> secret tool that, you know, like it's easy to do properly if you have the right information. And there's so much benefit. So we work a lot with high school athletes and we really feel that if we can get that switch to happen at a younger age, you know, we really help our high school athletes to understand that this is a competitive edge because the people you're competing against don't get it yet. You know, they, they mm -hmm. often start to figure it out a little bit later on. Yeah, that's cool. Do you think the teenage female athlete is getting, I don't know, uh, more mentally strong around food and body image? No, no. <laughs> I, don't. Uh... I, think, I think no, I think I think there's like many that come to us that are doing that work and, you know, they're honoring their body. And there's still many that come with like really a lot of diet culture in their homes and in their locker rooms and on their teams. And, you know, a lot of um, pressure to I mean, look at social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, hmm. uh, do you have philosophies about fueling? Sure. <laughs> so many. I mean, I think, you know, we touched a little bit on relative energy deficiency in sport um, and, and under fueling. I think it does start with adequacy. We absolutely have to be adequately fueling our body to support what we're asking it to do. And that's for recreational exercisers all the way up to elite athletes. We can't be functioning at a high level in a chronic energy deficit and expect optimal performance for any extended period of time. So the foundation is absolutely built in adequacy. And then once we can establish that we know that is happening, um, we definitely work with our athletes around, you know, how do you adequately meet your needs in a, in a very balanced way? And how do you start to do that consistently? So really stepping away from any quick fix, fad diet, short term strategies, but how do we do this in an adequate and balanced way that you can sustain? And how are you balanced? I mean, you said that you talked to or worked with high school athletes. So in part, I think my question relates to them. But you know, like, how are you balancing that adequacy, you know, fueling properly with body image, and then on the performance side, sort of, you know, I'm going to call the myths of the power to weight ratio. I mean, I'm not ignorant that there is relationship between the two, but I think it's sort of glorified that, you know, the lighter you are, the faster you are, which is not always the case. Sure. So we do do a ton of education of just the risks of under fueling. And so when they are made aware that, you know, trying to prioritize appearance or trying to be thinner inevitably often does put them in an energy deficit and helping them understand that this long persistent energy deficit really does show up in negative ways. Many of them have examples around them or examples, you know, in their own life that that they can see that. And so we do just continue to, you know, challenge, um, I would say we challenge diet culture and we continue to encourage people to honor their body and really look at food as um, as self-care and as opposed to having their relationship with food revolve around self-restriction. Do you get a pushback? We do. We do. Um, and it just takes education. It takes empathy. It takes building trust. Um, it, it helps to help them understand that, you know, we've been in their shoes. All of the dietitians on my team, you know, we've been in their shoes either, you know, as athletes or working with other athletes. And so validating their story, validating their experience and building trust with them and helping them, you know, sometimes it's very small steps to get them to see the difference. And then over time, they really start to realize the value of, of honoring their body in the way that they fuel themselves. I would suspect that it helps when you're working with a team so that, you know, it becomes sort of this team culture of eating properly and fueling properly. The team culture is great because you then start to have the support, you know, if nutrition and athletic training and strength and conditioning and, you know, physical therapists, anyone else who's around the team, if everybody is really aligned in their messaging, that is a fantastic way to start to change the culture around food and fueling. Of course, if you're coaches and anyone else at a higher level, depending on the level we're talking about, if everybody's aligned in their messaging, I think, you know, that starts to change the culture for how teams fuel and how teams think about their body and how they take care of themselves. Well, let's switch to your work with Liberty. Like, what actually are you doing with them? 
Great question. So about two years ago, I was asked if I'd be interested in coming on as a consultant for the New York Liberty. So I do live in Boston and obviously there in Brooklyn. So the WNBA season is in the summer. So I do spend a good amount of time from about April to October bouncing back and forth to Brooklyn to support them. I do travel a little bit with them, um, or if they play in Connecticut, that's kind of a home game for me, so pop up to Connecticut. So I'm popping in and out and being, you know, present with the team as much as I possibly can, but, you know, I think one of the beauties of the last couple of years is we all realize we can do quite a bit remotely. So I, I am able to FaceTime and phone call and text and Zoom with the other members of the performance team um, and with our general manager, assistant GM coaches, anybody that I need to be in touch with. I can I can really do that work from here. And then I come on site, obviously, because in-person interaction is super important as well. So some of the things we do, I mean, we kick off the year with our pre-participation exams that are led by our head athletic trainer and our team physicians, where the athletes do go through a battery of preseason screening and tests. And so nutrition is a part of that. We'll be able to um, pull lab data and see what their baseline is before we start the season and do initial intakes with each of the athletes. So Um, Obviously a little less formal with the returners because I know them and I've worked with them in the past, but definitely spending a lot of time to get to know some of the new athletes coming in and learning about their nutritional history and their food preferences and anything that, you know, we should be aware of. And so then as the season unfolds, I work pretty closely with the chefs that feed us at home and work with our operations director to go through um, how we're feeding on the road. And so that's really a lot of my collaboration is making sure that our menus are set up for pre-practice and post-practice, pre-game meal, post-game meal, meals on the road. And then once we have our lab data from the beginning of the year, interpreting the labs and then working with the athletes on any dietary modifications or dietary supplements that they would benefit from, um, and then just staying in touch with them throughout the season and checking in and troubleshooting if issues arise. Wow, that's awesome. I love it. I have so many questions too. (laughs) Uh, So one question is, the athletes that are coming to you at the beginning of the year after these all these tests and whatnot, and they have their individual meeting with you, like what kind of concerns or uh, ideas are they coming to you with that you're able to answer? You know, everybody's trying to optimize performance. Many of our athletes compete um, in back-to-back seasons. So many of them are competing in the WNBA season across, um, you know, the, the better part of the summer throughout, you know, a six-month season. And then they wrap up quickly. And then many of them go overseas to play in a second season. Um, And so really the themes are around recovery um, and, you know, how to, how do we continue to fuel the body and hydrate the body in a way that sustains many of our athletes who are competing pretty much 12 months out of the year. And then, you know, this year the Olympics is coming up. So we'll be looking at, you know, how do we continue to make sure people are meeting their needs to sort of support the regular season with, the Olympics packed in the middle of our season. I love that you went through sort of, well, I love that you talked about that they were cooked. So that was one of my questions is sort of like, how do meals work? And so like, talk a little bit more about what the cooks are doing when they're cooking for the athletes and when the athletes are, you know, having to do that on their own and what's happening on the road, maybe more specifically. Um, All such great questions. And, you know, this exists very differently at different levels of sport. And so if we're comparing, you know, some of the professional male leagues versus the female leagues, and then obviously if we're looking at the collegiate level, it does exist quite differently. And I I think it does come down to funding and, and just sort of the setup and the way things happen. But um, currently at the Liberty, we, we are very fortunate to have the support to feed our athletes breakfast on every practice day and then lunch post-practice. And then on a game day, obviously it depends on what is our game time, but there would be, for an evening game, there would be a breakfast and then um, a pregame meal and a postgame meal. If the game's earlier in the day, it would just be pregame, postgame. And then on the road, there's there's sort of a combination of uh, feeding the team or, you know, occasionally, you know, they're on their own for meals as well. We like to give them that freedom and flexibility to kind of get what they would like as well. I would suspect that the post-game meal, I mean, I would love that, having somebody feed me after afterwards and I don't have to worry about, you know, like the, <laughs> the window of getting all what you need to recover properly. That sounds amazing. 
Right. I mean, it's a little different. I know you said you did a lot of cycling races and, you know, I've done um, some marathons. It looks a little different than what's at the end of an endurance race where you just get have like a bunch of bagels, <laughs> some water and maybe some bananas. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some of those races, they get you some extra stuff. But no, it's nice. It's it's a it's a post game meal. It's, um, you know, catered and really nice options to give them really everything that they could need. When I spoke to Mary Ellen offline, she recommended Stacy Sims' books, Roar and Next Level. Both are books I talk about all of the time and recommend to friends all of the time. Since she and I talked about young female athletes, Mary Ellen also suggested Raising Body Positive Teens, a parent's guide to diet-free living, exercise, and body image. All of these books are available on the Hear Her Sports Bookshop page. Every single order you make through our bookshop page supports this podcast. A small portion of your purchase goes directly to us. Your purchases also help local bookshops. Find out more and order at hearhersports.com slash books. You can also find the link from our main menu at hearhersports.com. Thank you for your ongoing support and for using Bookshop when you purchase your books. Hey there, my name is Michael Laminato and this is Pit Pass F1, a brand new podcast that'll take you closer to the action of the world's most prestigious motorsport. From Monaco to Miami and Australia to Azerbaijan, Pit Pass F1 is on the ground and has you covered. Esteemed F1 journalists Julianne Serasoli and Chris Medland will take you inside the sport every round. They'll keep you up to date with the latest news breaking in Formula One and the most influential views shaping the world of Grand Prix racing. Every Friday, we'll be bringing you a track guide and race preview, and Chris and Drew will be in your feed every morning from Saturday through to Monday to keep you up to date on all the day's action on and off the track. So if you want to be in the know on the latest in Formula One, subscribe wherever you get your favourite podcasts and visit us at evergreenpodcasts.com. Pit Pass F1, a brand new show for Evergreen Podcasts. And now let's get back to my conversation with sports dietitian Mary Ellen Kelly, who currently works with the WNBA team, New York Liberty. When we were communicating prior to recording, one of the things I said is that, you know, I would love to get some sort of specific example about some of your athletes. And again, not to give away secrets or anything like that, but more specifics are interesting. So I'm just curious if is there an example that you can give from maybe what one of the high level Liberty players, um, what they learned from you and, and sort of the performance increase that they've seen? Sure. I think um, so the, the concept of nutrient timing, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, of just the bookend of how you train. Right. So that means I think all athletes and active individuals and humans, you know, need to be paying attention to just their overall diet and their overall, the balance of everything that they're taking in. But it's the nutrient timing strategy. So that that is the bookend of what we take in pre and post that I think can really always continue to be dialed in and figured out. And so that's just evaluating the market of, you know, what are some of the different products on there that might work better for one athlete versus another athlete? Um, or, you know, what are some different food strategies? Many times there's what we as practitioners learn in the textbook versus what actually works for the athlete. So, you know, how do we work with their pregame energy and nerves and um, feelings and how do we deal with their gastrointestinal tolerance. So some of that, I think, is the individualization of a pregame strategy that works for each athlete is something that um, I and the rest of our performance team really try to dial in and support. So some athletes might want something a little bit higher in carbohydrate or lower in carbohydrate. Um, Some people do better with fluids with carbs and electrolytes throughout the entire game, whereas others really have to focus on their their halftime strategy. And then post-game as well. I think many athletes, it's pretty easy to just finish a game and, and win or lose, sort of the emotion takes over and they don't dial in recovery. And so that's something that our team prioritizes pretty strongly. And I, I, I can't say one specific athlete, um, or I, I don't want to call it one specific athlete, but I was like, as a whole, 
this group really does prioritize the bookend of what they're taking in pre and post. So sometimes I feel like nutrition is super easy. You need adequate calories. You need, you know, protein, carbohydrates, fats, all that stuff. But sometimes it feels super complicated. Like, what are your thoughts about that? Because it seems like we can mess it up really easily, I guess. <laughs> you know, it seems easy, but then we mess it up so often. So what I'm hearing you say is sometimes nutrition can be super easy and sometimes it can be super hard. And I would say my answer to that is yes and yes, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, nutrition can be and probably should be simplified for so many people. Um, I think it, it does get overcomplicated. So it does start with that foundational knowledge. I think many, many, many people are not actually doing the basics because Either they haven't been taught or they've been misinformed or they think it needs to be harder than it is. So they, um, you know, it, it feels harder. And so then they don't engage with probably simple activities that could support their nutrition. So I would say it can be very simple. And then for folks who want to take a deeper dive and get more specific and start to look a little bit deeper into the things that they're doing, there's so much more we can all continue to do to optimize our nutrition. And that's actually one of the things that my team prioritizes is meeting clients where they're at. So some people really are just looking for that very basic, simple, evidence-based, sustainable strategy you know, I, do, I don't want to think about this. Can you make it super easy for me? And, and that's what we're here to do. And then other folks will come to us saying, like, I know all the basics. I know, you know, you're not teaching me about fruits and vegetables. I, I get it. Um, and so they want to dig a little bit deeper. And um, my team and I really love doing that work as well, is getting a little bit deeper. And how do we how do we try to get them that extra percent or that extra um, support that nutrition can give them? OK, so what would you consider as the basics? The, oh, okay, great. So the basics would be, as I said, I'd say we start, we do start with adequacy. Like, are you adequately meeting your needs every day? Have you stepped away from this sort of like restrictive cycle where, you know, you have days where you kind of go all day without eating? Have you gotten to a place where you are adequately fueling your day, eating consistently throughout the day? I think the basics start there and then with fluid and hydration as well. And then, you know, Super basic is the idea of a performance plate, which is a strategy that's utilized, I would say, throughout this country at every level now um, in the Olympics and college and pro. A lot of, you know, I and many of my peers utilize the performance plate, which just teaches people, can you check these three boxes every time you build a plate? Protein, energy, color. And so energy is carbs and color is fruits and veggies. So I start there with almost everybody. If your meals don't have protein, energy, and color every time, there's a good chance that you are going to start to run low on, you know, one of the macronutrients or on your fiber intake or on obviously many of your vitamins and minerals if you're if you're not hitting that color box with fruits and vegetables. So I do a ton of work with people around that very simple behavioral strategy of can you build a three-step meal with protein, carbs and color every single time? And then within that, we know we can get more specific. So then can they start to vary their vegetables a little bit more? Can we make sure that they really are meeting their protein needs? And are they varying their protein sources to make sure they're getting, you know, a wide variety of options? Can we can we get creative just with the way that they do food so that they start to, you know, really enjoy it and they don't get bored? And so start to expand with their culinary skills around, you know, what are, what are the different ways that you prepare food? So there's ways that we start with the basics and then there's ways that we start to get more and more creative to try to help them be more sustainable and, and really enjoy what they're doing so they don't see it as short term and quick fix, but they really see it as part of their lifestyle. Right. That's cool. And you mentioned the supplements. Are people curious about whether they're taking the right supplements or if they should take them at all or both? Or like, what are people asking you about supplements? Both of those. So people do come in like, here's what I'm taking, X, Y, and Z. Should I be taking it or should I be taking something else? Or many people just, I think, like want to jump into the supplement bandwagon. So it's like, I want to, I want to take something. <laughs> um, right. And so we always back those folks up and say like, well, let's look at food first. Um, we really want to take a look at food first and make sure that folks are doing what they need to do. It's 
more effective and, um, you know, safer and cheaper actually to focus on food. But then once we find that people really are doing all the things they need to do through food, sometimes with, you know, with the help of labs, we could actually say, okay, and in addition to what you're doing through food and with this lab data, we can actually suggest that you might need, you know, this vitamin D supplement or this iron supplement or something else. So we definitely individualize supplement recommendations. We're very committed to third-party testing when it comes to dietary supplements. So I think that could be an episode in and of itself, but the dietary supplement industry is not as tightly regulated as we as consumers probably would like it to be. And so we do a lot of education around third-party testing and reputable brands. Mm, Interesting. Something that you've said that is important to you, and you mentioned earlier in the episode, is that it's about self-care, not self-control. That makes it sound like there still are quite a few issues around eating, um, food. Sure. So I think, you know, many of us were sort of raised in in diet culture, right? So we find that whether we realize it or not, there are so many food rules. And um, I would say the encouragement of restriction is something that is very loud and lives in our in our current society. And so that is a problem. But I think more and more folks are realizing that the answer is is around centering one's body and identifying food as part of self-care and honoring our bodies through food instead of using food as punishment and restriction and recognizing that to celebrate our body and all that it can do, taking good care of it with food as a part of it is is really sort of a new theme or newer theme that I, I'm loving seeing it evolve. And, and I want to see it continue to evolve that people realize food can take care of them instead of food being the thing that they need to punish themselves with or make restrictions or make up rules, but really celebrate it and take really good care of themselves through food. That's a good segue to my next question, which is that I recently spoke to a vegan athlete. And that's very appealing. Being a vegan is appealing in this, you know, in terms of climate change and other, you know, animal care and whatnot. But the first thing I think about when somebody says they're a vegan is just like, I don't want to be that person who goes to somebody's house for dinner and says, oh, well, I can't eat that, or goes to a restaurant and has to, like, futz around with a menu. So, like, I don't know, how, how do you, how do you get around the aspect that I'm not liking about eating in a particular way and still do what you're talking about, self-care and eating properly and for proper fueling? Well, I think the choice to follow a vegan diet um, or a 100% plant-based diet is a personal choice. And, and for many people, it does come down to the effect on the environment or, you know, with animals. But for many people, I think it takes your own kind of internal examination on your priorities around food. And so if ultimately the goal is to be fluid and flexible and be able to enjoy these situations where you go to someone's house and can sort of enjoy the food and eat what everyone's eating and enjoy the menu, then, you know, many people have adopted sort of a flexible eating style where they are, you know, we'll say like vegan when it makes sense and then not vegan right. when it doesn't make sense. And what ac- ends up actually happening is there's still a huge emphasis on plants and there is a significant reduction in animal proteins that, you know, you choose to do on your own time. But it, it gives you that fluidity and flexibility to say in certain scenarios, I, I may engage in eating um, other foods, but you've still done a significant increase in your plant intake and you've done a significant decrease in you know, the animal food sources. So there's a way I think that people can can do both, that you don't have to be 100% plant-based and vegan to reach some of the goals that you're talking about. From your perspective as, you know, the science person, not your personal opinions about being, you know, like eating plant-based or meat or whatever, do you have thoughts in terms of performance about eating vegan or not vegan or eating meat or not meat? 
I mean, we do know that science supports the needs for, for adequacy and specifically for protein content to support, you know, athletes and all the work that they are asking their active muscles to do. So I think being vegan can pose a lot of challenges for the athlete to maximize and, and optimize and meet their needs. It's absolutely possible. It just takes an intense level of commitment and diligence to truly dial in, you know, meeting total calorie needs and meeting protein needs every single day with a with a strict vegan plan. I think I maybe you and I discussed this prior to being in the WNBA. I was actually um, a full-time dietitian in the National Football League and you can imagine the needs of some of those bodies are are incredibly high. I did have the opportunity to work with a couple of vegan athletes at that level and I can tell you that Probably in my tenure there, there were two athletes that truly committed themselves to the type of, I would say, discipline around food required in order to meet their needs and keep their body um, supported to match the demands of their sport. So it really, if someone is choosing to compete at a really high level and choosing to be vegan, then they're, they're choosing to just be very specific and dialed in around how their diet is going to meet their needs. And did they struggle with that? I mean, struggle is such a bad, I, I don't mean struggle. I mean, was it's it, a, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great question. So so many athletes around my two plant-based athletes tried to do it. And I mean, for some of them, it lasted like one meal and they'd be texting me from position <laughs> meeting rooms and being like, Marilyn, can you get me some bacon? Like, right, you know, right. so they're starving. So I would say more athletes struggled with the attempt to try it. At the time that I was in the NFL, I would say there was just a lot of popular press around the vegan movement. And so many folks tried it and it just, it just wasn't going to work for them. I had, like I said, I had two athletes that I think worked really, really hard at it. It was a lifestyle. I just know that it was something that they came to us already doing. And it's something that I have to imagine they're probably still doing. It really was a way of life for them. So I can say I I didn't see them struggling. I will just say they worked incredibly hard at their diet in order to meet their needs to support the demands that were going on at that level. One of the things that I think I loved and saw that came from having those two athletes on our team is the emphasis on plants, right? So it really was raising awareness for many of the athletes around them of just how we all can benefit from building our base in plants. And then I would say then the decision to add animal protein to your plant base is an individual decision. Right, right. I sort of sidetracked us on this vegan <laughs> vegan conversation. So apologies no, for that. It. Yeah. Great. But, you know, I'd like to go back to my question about nutrition being complicated and or simple. And I loved your answer about that, but I do want to go back to it. I mean, there is so much information out there. You know, how does a person make sense of it all? And I could give you a lot of examples, but let's say an athlete is having some issues and would like to try addressing those issues with nutrition before trying something else. So so like one example I can think of is PMS. I had very bad PMS when I was racing and my doctor's recommendation was to go on the pill, which now feels to me like utterly antiquated thinking. But even now, antidepressants are prescribed for PMS. Or we could talk about athletes who suffer from more inflammation than they would like. So I'm just curious what an athlete is supposed to do and to make sense of all the information out there, but make it simple. Really great question. And I think, you know, as we know, there's more information out there than there ever has been. And when we look at some of the scenarios that you mentioned, whether it is PMS or inflammation, we have to remember that Nutrition is just one piece of the puzzle. So we also have to take a look at um, sleep. We also have to look at stress levels. And so really taking a look at the bigger picture and knowing that there's many variables that are going to tie into some of the things that you're talking about. Ideally, if somebody does feel that they are struggling with something that they sort of can't make sense of the information that they have at hand, ideally they are trying to reach out to a registered dietitian or a practitioner who can sit down and individualize the care. And so that's sitting down and going through a holistic intake of, you know, what's happening, what are you doing, what are you not doing, what are your traditional patterns, eating patterns, routines, sleeping, and and really doing 
a comprehensive evaluation and then figuring out what makes the most sense for that individual. And so we don't want to subscribe to sort of one practitioner, follow, you know, one doctor or one dietitian or read one book. We really want to take a holistic approach to this and say, okay, this is what this person is doing. What happens if we modify this and pay attention to that person's body and and see what makes the most sense for them. So there's definitely, there's what we find in the science and then there's some trial and error that we do need to do with our clients and, and build that trust and sort of figure out the best strategy for each individual. So you said something that made me think of a question I did not ask, and I think is super important. It's like, why should a regular person go see a nutritionist? What are, you know, you have this regular person, they think, oh, I eat fine. Like, why would they, what, what, what are they going to benefit from by going to a nutritionist? Well, I think it's, it's to the point of your first question, which is there is so much information out there and, and so many people are well-intentioned and and reading certain things, but maybe maybe what they're reading isn't actually what makes the most sense for them. And so what what we do as dietitians is really try to stay on top of the literature and try to look at every individual scenario with a broad lens of of taking in all the different variables and trying to stay abreast of the research and figuring out in a holistic way, you know, somebody might be presenting with what they think is the issue. And once they sort of unload what's going on, you know, with with a diet recall and sort of going through their different behaviors, we're able to help them look at it through a different lens. So it's just having a third party to sit down with them and say, okay, you know, here's all the information, the data that you presented to me based on what you're telling me, here are some of the things that I think we could try. And ultimately, I, I don't know how the average consumer can make sense of all the information. And so in the same way that you would go to a specialist to take care of your car or a specialist to fix something in your home, I think how do we become experts on all of the information that's on the internet? I think ultimately going to somebody that does this for a living is what is going to allow you to make sense of it all and sit down and really kind of take your entire profile and figure out a strategy that makes sense for you at that stage of your life. And then that actually changes throughout people's lifetime. I mean, I'm just thinking about this now, how beneficial it would be for women who are going into menopause or perimenopause even to visit nutritionists, because as you mentioned, it's a time period in our lives when everything changes. Absolutely. And in in my experience in working with clients and, you know, I'm taking a look at the literature, I think this is really a time where things are starting to come out more and more on perimenopause. But for quite a long time, that's really not where the research was. The recommendations really hadn't been placed out there for us to start to interpret and start to apply. And so we are really now at a time where we're starting to understand perimenopause, understand the changing needs, and practitioners can come to the table and really work with women in their 40s and 50s and help them have a good understanding of changes that they may need to make that they've never even thought of. For a long time, I think people would just dismiss everything to middle age and just say, well, you know, that's what comes with middle age. And women are now stepping up and saying, like, well, that's not how I want it to be. So how do I, how do I make changes and pay attention to my changing body and make the changes I need to make in order to counter whatever negative experiences they might be having? One of my favorite books was written by our friend Heidi Skolnick is Total Body Reset. And one of the reasons I like it so much is that she talks about how much protein older people need in that book. Can you talk a little bit about protein and the protein needs for older people? Absolutely. So as we age, I think many people are not aware that they do really need to start paying attention to spreading their protein throughout the day and really trying to hit some higher protein targets than they probably naturally would be if they weren't paying attention. And what I find and in conversations with Heidi and with other practitioners in this space is breakfast tends to be the most challenging. So for folks who do consume animal protein, I think, you know, we're able to hit a minimum of 30 grams of protein at lunch and dinner, um, as long as, you know, we do consume animal protein. If we're not consuming animal protein, it just takes a little bit more mindfulness to make sure we're hitting those targets. But at breakfast time, the recommendation, you know, as we're aging is really getting close to 30 grams of protein at breakfast, or at very least a minimum of 20 grams at that meal. 
And if you just think of sort of traditional breakfast foods, many people just sort of grab, you know, a quick bar or some people just have a cup of coffee or people have, you know, toast and jam and something that that tends to be very low in protein. And so it's a very active shift to think about how do I increase my protein at breakfast and then just double checking to make sure you're eating adequately and getting good protein throughout the day. Are people going to see benefits right away if they start eating protein at breakfast? I mean, one thing that they, a benefit that they may start to notice is, you know, protein plays a huge role in satiety. And so if you are eating a breakfast that is higher in protein and getting some fiber in there, one of the immediate things that people start to notice is they're less hungry throughout mid-morning and that breakfast really holds them over and starts to sustain them. So that is something that I definitely know people will notice when they add protein into their breakfast and, and get it up a little bit higher. Well, that's cool. Well, thank you. To wrap things up, did I miss anything? Do you want to leave listeners with anything in particular? I don't think so. I really, I enjoyed talking to you. I mean, you know, I love just sort of supporting people at all levels and their goals and what they're trying to do and how can they utilize food to support what they're looking to do. But I really, I just appreciated the conversation and, you know, love talking about how nutrition can support folks at any level of their journey in sport. Well, great. Well, thanks so much for being here. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking about nutrition. I am sure you've heard me say that many times. Thank you, Mary Ellen, for the opportunity to do so again. If you're interested in nutrition as well, check out the Hear Her Sports Nutrition playlist on Spotify. Sharing the playlist would be a super way to share Hear Her Sports with your friends and training partners. Of course, all of the episodes are available on your favorite podcast player, Spotify or otherwise, or on our website, hearhersports.com. Also on the website, find ways to reach me, discover more about each athlete in her show notes, and to support the podcast through Bookshop, Buy Me a Coffee, and Deboso. Hear Her Sports is a proud member of Evergreen Podcasts. Always thank you to them and to you for your ongoing support. It's an absolute pleasure to be part of this community of women's sports fans. Thank you for listening. I'll be back in two weeks. Bye-bye. We're going to have to start this over. Sports stars. They're like superheroes. But they're actually real. Which is why we've made a podcast about them. You see... They've all got a story. But too many of these stories were cut short. Kobe Bryant. Payne Stewart. Flo jo, Phil Hughes. Justin Fashionew. We're writing episodes about all of them. And sadly, many more. Death of a Sports Star. A new series from Crowd Network.